Hello, welcome back to Seasonal Eating at Mount Vernon. My name is Sarah Marie Massey. I'm the manager of historic trades at George Washington's Mount Vernon. Um, this is part four and we're talking about autumn. Um, so what we're going to discuss today, we're going to talk a little bit about um, kind of what autumn meant for uh, people in the 18th century, particularly here on this estate. Uh, we'll talk about what foods are available in autumn. Uh, as usual, we'll examine an 18th century menu for that season. Uh, we'll talk about the diet of the enslaved community during this time of year. Um, and then we'll do another focus on preservation techniques, this time focusing on meat instead of fruits and vegetables. And then our last uh, big section will be looking a bit at 18th century origins of Thanksgiving dinner. Um, so let's jump right in and talk about uh, what autumn did mean for um, for people here at Mount Vernon. Um, autumn was very much a transitional season, and I I mean that I mean obviously the weather is changing and so forth, um, but you do see bits of themes from what was happening in the summer and then going into themes of, of kind of how food was handled in the winter. Um, like, like summer, autumn was a huge season for um, harvesting. Um, you know, again, we're, our, modern, our modern horticulture department harvests like 28 different varieties of things in September. Um, which is the same amount as they're they're harvesting in in the height of summer, um, but you do see a shift in terms of what is is being harvested. So a lot of those summer uh, to to winter over. Um, so what is growing in autumn? Well, um, you do see the end of the season for things like melons, beans, tomatoes, peppers. These are all crops that are at their peak in late summer. So, you know, July, August, um, they continue into September, some of them into early October, uh, and, and, and then they're done. So the rest of autumn, you wouldn't have them. Um, autumn is prime time for root vegetables. I'm sure you guys are used to seeing that in your grocery stores. Uh, you know, carrots, beets, Jerusalem artichokes, um, which if you have watched other episodes of the series, uh, we talked a little bit about during the spring, um, the, the spring series. Um, parsnips, radishes, turnips, potatoes, and sweet potatoes. Those are all things that would have been harvested uh, this time of year. Um, pumpkins and winter squash are coming in. Um, coleworts, again, another uh, sort of uh, 18th century term for greens that are in the cabbage family, um, things like kale and collards and things like that. Um, you do see a second crop of cabbages. You see a second crop of lettuce coming in in the fall, um, celery, mushrooms, and then late fruit. Um, you know, things like apples, pears, persimmons, medlars. Um, so those are all things that, that, that would be harvested this time of year. Um, other foods would still be avail you know, available. So like uh, onions and other alliums, um, they, were, they would be preserved, but maybe not necessarily something you're harvesting um, this late in the season. Um, and, you know, as usual, this is reflected in 18th century men menus. And of course, um, these bills of fare that I've been showing you each episode uh, they are meant to be seasonal, um, so they are specific to the time of year um, when the, the meal is being served. So this one's from October. Um, you'll see that there are greens. You know, we talked about the coleworts. Um, you see that there's salad uh, in the first course. Um, again, lettuce is starting to come back. You have a, a second um, growing of lettuce, mashed potatoes, broccoli. Uh, broccoli kind of falls into the colwort family. Here at Mount Vernon, we don't tend to have a, a late broccoli season, but depending on where you are, um, certainly in Europe, they where in England where this would have been published, they would have been able to get broccoli in autumn. Um, stewed pippins. Pippins are a uh, an 18th century term for apples. There are, there are a variety of apples. Um, stewed mushrooms, celery fricassee, uh, and pears compote. 
So that's the kind of thing that the, the Washington family would be eating. How did things play out for the enslaved community? Um, well, they are dealing with the end of a lot of their summer crops as well. And because, um, because the, the summer season is closer in weather to um, conditions in Africa, um, a lot of the, the most traditional African foods um, would have been phasing out this time of year. Um, melons and summer squash were hugely important in the African diet. Green, well, we've got green beans here, but um, beans in general were hugely important to the African diet. They're on their way out. Um, peppers, tomatoes. Um, and as I mentioned in, in one of the, the previous episodes, um, the enslaved people had fewer methods of preservation that were available to them compared to um, the Washingtons. They didn't have access to sugar or regular access to salt other than what, what salt they could extract from um, the salted fish and salted meat that Washington was providing to them as rations. Um, they didn't have greenhouses, so they weren't able to um, have a lot of these, these vegetables out of season. Um, so this time of year would mean a lot of drying. That's one preservation technique that would be available to the enslaved people, um, particularly with the beans. Um, you know, beans were a really important staple crop for enslaved people because um, they're easy to grow. They're, they're, they produce extremely well. You know, they, they tend, you can, you can get a lot out of a relatively small number of plants. Um, and they produce for a, a number of months, you know, kind of throughout the summer and into the early fall. Um, and they can be eaten either fresh or dried. Um, and of course, they provide a, a, an important source of protein in the diet. Um, you know, when, when the, the meat and fish rations that Washington would have been providing were pretty meager. And so having this extra source of protein was, was really valuable. Um, and they don't really take a lot of additional effort to dry. For the most part, um, beans can be left on the vine when you want to dry them, um, or you can harvest and just dry in, in the open air. Um, and so then all you have to do is shell once, once the beans have dried on their own. Um, and, and having a crop that doesn't take additional effort to preserve was, um, as you can imagine, so they had such little free time. Um, so that, that was incredibly helpful. Um, another crop that would have been bountiful this time of year, sweet potatoes. Now, um, most of the, the enslaved people coming to Virginia in the 18th century were coming from West Africa, um, either the the current nation of West Africa or, or, or uh, uh, kind of the, the, that region more broadly. And in, in those parts of Africa, yams are a huge staple crop. Um, but in, in Washington's time, African yams were not being grown in the United States. And so sweet potatoes were a native crop. They developed in Central and South America. Um, we believe that the the Colombian expeditions, the fourth Colombian expedition, they brought potato or sweet potatoes back to Europe and Africa. Um, and so actually, the earliest references to potatoes in European cookbooks uh, are mostly they don't say sweet potatoes, but they mostly mean sweet potatoes. It's up until like the 1740s, more or less, um, almost all English cookbooks that reference potatoes are actually talking about sweet potatoes. So it's not until later in the 18th century that um, white potatoes or Irish potatoes, as they're called, um, become more accepted. Um, but these sweet potatoes are able to replace a lot of um, recipes. You know, they're, they're, you can use them in similar ways. They cook up in similar ways to um, the, the African yams. And so um, this, Autumn would be the time of year when they would be harvested. Um, another thing that would have been happening in the autumn, this would have been a really important time of year for foraging. Um, the picture that I have uh, on, on the right is a black walnut. Um, we know that walnuts were growing wild throughout Mount Vernon, um, throughout the estate. And 
we actually have found archaeological evidence of walnut hulls in the House for Families dig. So the House for Families is where um, many of the enslaved people assigned to Mansion House Farm would have lived from the 1760s through the 1790s. Um, and, and it had a, a root cellar, cellar that became a trash pit and um, walnut hulls are, are among the, the um, floral remains that, that we recovered. Um, and many of the things that enslaved people would have been foraging uh, from the wild would have been harvested this time of year, not just nuts, but persimmons, which we've talked about before, um, you know, many other other crops as well. Um, and this also would have been an important time of year for gleaning. So gleaning is um, going back after the harvest and collecting what's left, you know, the, the less desirable stuff. Um, and so thing, you know, uh, later, late fruits like the, the apples, um, peaches, things, or not peaches, apples, uh, pears, things like that. Um, the enslaved community were not being given those items by Washington, but they were available on the estate. And um, so gleaning would have been something that they would have been doing this time of year as well. So in addition to talking about the enslaved community, I wanted to focus a little bit on, um, you know, continue to talk about preservation in the 18th century. Um, in the last episode, uh, I talked about pickling and I talked about making sweet preserves. Um, and in one of the previous episodes, I talked about salting, um, you know, which is one way of preserving meat. Um, and specifically, we were focusing on salting the shad and herring uh, that that would have been uh, coming up the Potomac in the springtime. Um, but another method of preserving meat in the 18th century that you may be less familiar with um, is something called potting. Um, and so potting was done with all different varieties of meat, um, you know, including fish, including um, uh, shellfish. You know, here we have uh, a, a recipe from Hannah Glass, uh, The Art of Cookery Made Plain and Easy, uh, which is kind of like the, the joy of cooking of the 18th century. It's the most popular British cookbook, uh, particularly in the, the British colonies. Um, and and you know, I believe George and Martha did own a copy of that. Um, so this is for potting beef and you're doing it the way that you would pot venison. So it says, cut a lean, uh, cut the lean of a buttock of beef in pound pieces. For eight pounds of beef, take four ounces of saltpeter. Um, so saltpeter is a um, sodium or potassium nitrate. And, um, you know, it was, it was something that, that was commercially available. Um, and then it, the, the recipe, there's a, there's a misprint because it repeats. So it says um, four ounces of Peter salt. Those are actually the same thing. Um, take a pint of white salt. White salt was basically salt that was derived from taking seawater and boiling it. It had a finer crystal um, than, than the, the saltpeter. Um, and one ounce of salt prunella. So salt prunella is basically derived from saltpeter um, by melting down the saltpeter in a crucible and fusing it with charcoal powder, um, which like creates a nitrite instead of a nitrate. Um, and nitrite, you, you, you probably know a little bit about the debate over nitrates and nitrites uh, and their, the, the health concerns involved. You find the most nowadays in, in things like um, bacon. Um, nitrates are healthier than nitrites. So the salt prunella today would not be something that we would generally use, um, but it is effective at, at pres preserving the meat. Um, salt creates an environment where it's difficult for bacteria to grow. Um, so at any rate, you take all of these salts, uh, you beat them all very fine, mix them well together and rub the salts into the beef and then let it lie four days turning it twice a day. So essentially you're, you're um, dry brining it uh, and you know, making it so that the bacteria can't grow. Then put it into a pan and cover it with pump water and a little of its own brine um, because part of what the salt does too, while well, even though you're dry brining, it does pull out a lot of the moisture from the, the beef. Um, 
So you'd be taking some of that liquid and adding that back. Um, then bake it in an, an oven with household bread. Um, so you're not mixing it with the bread. You're just doing it at the same time. Uh, ovens were pretty large and they could fit multiple things typically. Um, till it is as tender as chicken. Then drain from the gravy uh, and bruise it abroad and take out all the skin and sinews then pound it in a marble mortar and lay it in a broad dish. Um, so, so you want to take out the gravy because that is more likely to spoil. Um, and, and then you're getting rid of the, the parts that are gonna make it tough and you're, you're basically making it into a paste, pounding it into a paste. Um, mix it in it an ounce of cloves and mace and three quarters of an ounce of pepper and one nutmeg all beat very fine. Um, so these spices, they're obviously for flavor, but they also all have um, some preservation qualities as well. Um, mix it all very well with the meat, then clarify a little fresh butter and mix with the meat to make it a little moist. Mix it very well together and press it down into pots very hard and set it in the oven's mouth uh, just to settle. So the oven's mouth would be warm, but you're not really cooking it. You're just kind of reheating it. Um, and cover it two inches thick with clarified butter. When cold, cover it with white paper. And I think we mentioned last time that, that clarified butter uh, or any kind of fat is going to provide a, um, a, an airproof seal that, that keeps bacteria out. Um, so it helps to preserve. And of course, the white paper is going to prevent dust and, and other things from getting in there as well. Um, people also potted uh, different types of, of fowl. So here we have, um, you know, to pot pigeons or fowls. Uh, the, the technique is very similar, um, but you're not using all of those, those types of salts that you might have used um, with the beef. And so, uh, you know, again, you, you're, you're, cooking it, um, you, you're, you're baking it till it's very tender, you're pouring off the gravy, um, you're pounding it in a mortar and, and seasoning it and then putting it into a pot and pouring clarified butter over the top of it um, to make sure that it's nice and sealed. Um, so that was, you know, the, I, I focused on the meat this time of year um, because, uh, October would have been the beginning of the, the slaughtering season here on the estate. Um, it's better, I mean, obviously, if you're, you're going to eat meat right away, um, you're going to slaughter year round. Um, but if you're doing it for preservation purposes, um, you want to slaughter mostly in the colder months, um, because oftentimes meat would have been, um, uh, you know, air cured, so to speak. So basically hung and, and cured uh, for a week or longer, um, which helps keep it, it fresh. And that's going to that's that's going to do better uh, in cold weather. Um, and so we have records here at Mount Vernon, for example, of hog slaughtering going from uh, like October through January. Um, so we would have been right smack in the middle of it um, during during the, the autumn season. Um, and it wasn't just hogs that were slaughtered this time of year for preservation. It would have been cattle, it would have been um, you know, chickens and other fowl, uh, so all kinds of things. Um, speaking of fowl, uh, this time of year, you know, in our society today, we tend to think about Thanksgiving dinner as kind of the highlight of our um, culinary traditions in autumn. Um, so I did want to talk a little bit about 18th century origins of Thanksgiving dinner. Um, and, you know, most of us know the mythical story uh, of the, the first Thanksgiving with the pilgrims and the Im Indians. And most of us also know that that, that story is not really true, um, but we might not necessarily know kind of all the details. So, um, you know, days of Thanksgiving were actually really common in European culture throughout the 17th, well, actually 16th, 17th, and 18th centuries. Um, but these days of Thanksgiving tended to be one-off events. They were not annual. Um, they tended to be for specific things that, that happened. Um, so military victories or particularly good harvests or providential rain, you know, things like that. Um, they tended to be a time for reflection. 
Um, they, they weren't necessarily a time of feasting. Um, and they, they actually took place in a number of regions before the Mayflower ever landed. Um, so for example, the, there were several, you know, Thanksgiving proclamations that, that occurred in Texas, Florida, um, you know, those are Spanish territories. Um, there, there are Thanksgivings that are proclaimed in, in Jamestown starting in 1607. Um, you know, there, there were Thanksgivings in, in Maine. Um, and there were also several one-off uh, days of Thanksgiving that took place that were national celebrations um, you know, before, before Thanksgiving became an annual holiday. Um, and that leads us to George Washington. So he's actually the first one who proclaims a national day of Thanksgiving. Um, in, in 1789, you know, Washington had just taken office for his first term. Um, he wrote a confidential letter to James Madison in August of that year, um, asking advice about how to approach uh, the the Senate about creating you know proclaiming a day of Thanksgiving um, to honor the the ratification of of the Constitution um, things progressed pretty quickly um, 1789 in September the the House of Representatives introduced a resolution to create a joint committee uh, of the two houses of Congress to approach Washington about. Um, creating a Thanksgiving proclamation, and he immediately acquiesced. And so on October 3rd, um, he announced this, this uh, Thanksgiving Day, um, which he set for uh, November 26th, which was the, the last Thursday in November. Um, and I have the first two paragraphs of the, the proclamation here. Um, so it reads, by the President of the United States of America, a proclamation. Whereas it is the duty of all nations to acknowledge the providence of Almighty God, to obey his will, and to be grateful for his benefits, and humbly to implore his protection and favor. And whereas both houses of Congress have by their joint committee requested me to recommend to the people of the United States a day of public thanksgiving and prayer to be observed by acknowledging with grateful hearts the many signal favors of Almighty God, especially by affording them an opportunity peaceably to establish a form of government for their own safety and happy, happiness. Um, so the proclamation goes on. You can read it in its full on Mount Vernon's website. I have the link below. Um, you can also just Google. It, you know, it's widely available online. Um, but I guess the thing to, to note here is that uh, although this is the first national thanksgiving it's not a harvest festival um it's really in thanks for the ability you know washington specifically mentions the ability to create our our, our own government later in the document he talks about thanking uh, almighty god for his kindly regard during the revolutionary war you know his care for the soldiers um and and for the prosperity of the new government going forward um there and it it was a one off. It was not something that that became an annual celebration. You do see a few other presidents following suit. Um, James Madison, who Washington had originally consulted about um, about this proclamation, he proclaimed a day of Thanksgiving uh, for, to celebrate the end of the War of eighteen twelve. Um, and you know there are relatively few descriptions of feasts. That are associated with Thanksgivings in the 18th century. None of them uh, were associated with this this uh, proclamation that Washington gave. Um, so they were associated with other Thanksgivings, local Thanksgivings that were proclaimed um, either by ministers or or by local governments. Um, and they're they're pretty. They don't have a lot of detail. Uh, we basically only get these two descriptions. So in 1777, um, the Continental Congress declared a day of Thanksgiving to honor the victory at Saratoga. And the soldier Joseph Plum Martin uh, wrote in his journal, each man was given a half a gill of rice and a tablespoonful of vinegar. Um, so a gill is about a half cup, 
which means that if they're getting a half gill, that's like a quarter cup of rice and a tablespoon full of vinegar. Definitely not the kind of Thanksgiving that that we would all like to enjoy. Um, a 1784 description it seems to be a little bit more bountiful. Um, that author talks about uh, what a sight of pigs and geese and turkeys and fowls and sheep must have been slaughtered to gratify the voraciousness of a single day. Um, so we do have turkey mentioned there, uh, but turkey would have been one of, of many different types of, of meat being consumed. Um, and I think this is because, you know, the, the, the focus for Thanksgivings originally was on, um, on religious observation, you know, giving, giving thanks. It was more of a quiet holiday. Um, that changes in the 19th century. You do see uh, more and more Thanksgiving feasts being described. Um, and particularly this was happening in New England. Um, for those descendants of the, the Puritans, uh, a Thanksgiving feast was a little bit more palatable than other uh, autumn celebrations um, that that were coming from the the English tradition, um, such as Guy Fox Day and um, and Har Harvest Home, um, which happen around the same time of year, and are, are uh, Harvest Home particularly was a harvest celebration similar to Thanksgiving today. Um, but Thanksgiving was a, a more palatable holiday for them because it wasn't really nearly as rowdy. The, you know, those English holidays were often associated with drunkenness. Um, they were often occasions for the poor to, um, you know, come and, and beg uh, either food or money from, from their wealthier neighbors. Um, and, and so, uh, you know, Thanksgiving was a little bit more to the, the puritanical taste. Um, New Englanders continued to spread the, the Thanksgiving tradition to other parts of the, the country, um, but it did tend to be simply local observation. And it's not until uh, Sarah Josepha Hale um, became interested in, in promoting Thanksgiving that it really started to, to nationalize. Um, she was born in New England in 1788. Um, she was widowed and had five young children to support. Um, and so she turned to writing and she wrote a book called um, Northwood, A Tale of New England. And it has this, an entire chapter dedicated to uh, describing a Thanksgiving feast. Um, and, and she became the editor of Ladies Godie's book, or sorry, Godie's Ladies book, um, which basically became the most popular and influ influential women's magazine of the 19th century. And she used that the magazine um, to promote Thanksgiving. She also started an extensive letter writing campaign in, in um, 1846. Um, she, she wrote to um, you know, the governor of pretty much every state and, and territory, you know, trying to get them to proclaim Thanksgiving um, she she wrote to to uh, President Lincoln um, during the Civil War. She she kind of changed her attitude about Thanksgiving. She had always seen it as an important holiday, um, but she came to see it as a way of bringing the country together. Um, and that's when she really started to promote um, the the Pilgrim Thanksgiving myth. Um, you know. That, that myth is based on an event that happened in 1621. Um, we, I'm not going to go into great detail uh, debunking that, but, but it, you know, it's, it's likely, it, it is based on real events. There was a, a three-day feast that, um, that occurred, uh, you know, a Plymouth plantation um, between the, the, the pilgrims and the Wampanoag people. Um, but they, it doesn't seem as though they would have considered it a particularly special occasion. Um, and we have basically only two primary sources that support that, uh, that particular origin tale. Um, but for, for Hale, um, the Pilgrim story was a lot more palatable as an origin for Thanksgiving than, um, than Jamestown, for example, um, because Jamestown also was associated with the beginning of slavery and we're in the middle of the Civil War and so forth. Um, eventually, uh, 
you know, there, there was a, a proclamation in 1863 um, to, you know, President Lincoln um, made a, created a national holiday out of Thanksgiving um, to honor the victories at Gettysburg and Vicksburg. Um, and then it's in 1941, um, Congress actually uh, made it an annual, an annual celebration. Um, so that was a lot of history that I threw at you. Uh, let's get into a little bit more about the food. Um, that 18th century description of Thanksgiving did include a turkey. Um, turkeys seem to have been around in, in North America. They are, they are a North American native. Um, they seem to have been around in the Americas for about 10,000 years, possibly longer. Um, they, by, when the, the Spanish conquistadors arrived in the New World, um, turkeys seem to have been just relatively recently uh, domesticated. And contrary to what we would expect, um, domestication may not have been for the purpose of eating the turkeys. Um, different, different indigenous peoples treated turkeys differently. Some of them just wanted the feather, feathers um, for ceremonial purposes or um, uh, to create daily objects. Some of them ate only the eggs. Um, some of them did eat the meat. Um, but, you know, it's, it's, we, we can't assume that they were all domesticated simply to, to eat them. That said, um, turkeys were brought over, domesticated turkeys were brought over to Europe, and they quickly started to uh, replace other holiday meats um, for special occasions in European cookbooks and, and on European tables, including in England. Um, so they, they were often part of, um, of 18th century feasts. Um, remember how I, I referenced Hannah Glass, uh, the, she, she's kind of the, the equivalent of the joy of cooking of the 18th century. She has numerous recipes for um, roasting turkey, uh, boiling turkey. Um, she has numerous sauces for turkey. Um, everything from from kind of a white gravy to um, you know oyster sauces. Um, you know uh, she has mushroom sauces for turkey. Um, so it it really was kind of absorbed into the European diet, um, and it makes sense as a, a celebratory um, a celebratory bird why it would become part of the Thanksgiving meal um, simply because it it, it was part of the tradition of celebration. Um, the first mention of serving turkey with cranberry sauce actually comes from an author named Amelia Simmons. Um, and I have her recipe to stuff and roast a turkey or fowl here. Um, so she writes, one pound of soft wheat bread, three ounces of beef suet. Um, suet is a type of, of fat, it's the leaf fat. Um, uh, it was very common in, in 18th century cooking. Um, three eggs, a little sweet thyme, sweet marjoram, pepper and salt, and some add a gill of wine. And actually that's pretty close to a, a lot of modern stuffing recipes. You know, you've got your bread, you've got your, your eggs to bind it, you may add a little bit of fat, and then you've got your herbs, your salt and your pepper. Um, fill the bird therewith and sew it up. Hang down to a steady solid fire, basting frequently with butter and water and roast until a steam emits from the breast. Put one third of a pound of butter into the gravy, dust flour over the bird and baste with gravy. Serve up with boiled onions and cranberry sauce, mangoes, pickles, or celery. Oh, celery is another common uh, accompaniment to turkey, by the way, in 18th century cookbooks. Um, but I, I used this recipe from Amelia Simmons here uh, because she really, uh, she, her cookbook really is kind of the, the basis of a lot of um, 18th century, or a lot of 18th century recipes that uh, provide the origins of foods we eat at Thanksgiving today. Um, Amelia Simmons was an orphan. We know almost nothing about her. Um, she published a, a, a cookbook in, I, I think it was 1797. Um, and it is, it is the first cookbook published in America by an American author. And you, it's hard to overstate um, 
kind of what what a difference her her cookbook made. In a lot of ways, she's writing um, recipes that are very much in the English tradition, but she's the first author to really take account of um, American ingredients. So this cranberry sauce, for example, she doesn't tell you how to make the cranberry sauce, but she is talking about serving it. Um, she's the first cookbook, European cookbook writer um, to make use of cornmeal. Um, cornmeal was well known in Europe, but it's not something that was widely adopted. And so most English cookbook writers of the time just ignore the fact that it exists. Um, and a lot of Americans up to that point really felt the gap because they had these ingredients that they were using on a regular basis, um, but they had no guidance as to how to best make use of them. Um, so speaking of the cranberry sauce, let's talk a little bit about cranberries. Um, there are versions of cranberries um, from that are that were in Europe, um, but they're not really edible. They're they're mildly poisonous. I mean, you, you can you can eat them, but they're mildly toxic. Um, so small quantities. They're much more astringent than um, American cranberries. Um, but you do see the, the cranberries, um, American cranberries being adopted into um, European cooking really from, from an early time. Um, so this is a recipe from The Lady's Handmaid or A Complete System of Cookery published in 1758. Um, and it, it, it was written by Sarah Phillips. Um, and this is to keep fruit for tarts. Uh, Amelia Simmons also has a recipe for cranberry tarts. Um, and you have to kind of assume that she means you should cook cranberries the same way. Uh, but essentially, you're supposed to take gooseberries when they are, are grown full uh, before they turn and wipe and pick them one by one, put them into a wide mouth bottles, cork and close them and set them in a slack oven. So a slack oven is an oven at a low temperature. Um, till they are tender and cracked, then take them out of the oven and pitch the corks. By this method, you may keep several sorts of fruit as bullis, which is a type of um, plum, currants, damsons, also another type of plum, uh, pears, plums, etc. Only do these when they are ripe. Um, cranberries are brought in barrels from South Carolina and when in season are to be had at most pastry cooks. Several parts of England produce them, especially Cheshire. Um, and I find this really interesting because when you read uh, a lot of histories of cranberries and histories of cranberry sauce, they talk about how um, commercial production of cranberries didn't start until the 19th century, really the middle of the 19th century, like the 1840s. Um, and I think that um, to a certain extent, that's true in the sense that nobody figured out commercial ways of producing cranberries, like growing them and, and harvesting them in, in more efficient ways and on a larger scale. Um, but there's clearly an international market for cranberries um, by the 1750s because Sarah Phillips is writing about it. Um, and so this is, you know, this is a, an American food that is being distributed throughout the Western world. Um, pumpkin pie is another uh, Thanksgiving favorite. And Amelia Simmons, again, is um, the first person to write a recipe for pumpkin pie. It's actually labeled pumpkin pudding, P-O-M-P-K-I-N, pudding. Um, pudding is this whole category of food in the 18th century um, in England. Uh, there, in fact, um, there are a number of, of um, sort of popular books in the 18th century that talk about the British as pudding eaters, capital P, capital E. Um, it's, so it's kind of hard to overstate the importance of puddings uh, in, in the 18th century English diet and therefore the diet of colonists like Washington. Um, Puddings, we're, we're not talking custard cups here. Um, for the British, there are kind of two different styles of puddings. Um, there were boiled puddings, which were typically, um, so it's a mix of, of flour, usually milk or cream, eggs, uh, and then different flavorings. And 
So the boiled pudding would, you take your, your dough, your mixture, and you would wrap it in a, a floured linen cloth and then boil it. Um, and then there were baked puddings, which are essentially baked custards. Um, and that's the category that pumpkin pie falls into. And so this pumpkin pudding is Amelia Simmons taking this European or, or British cooking tradition and adapting it to American ingredients. Pumpkins are native to the New World. Um, they, they were being used over in, in England, uh, but they were... They were much more common over here. And um, so she's she's combining this, this British cooking technique with this American ingredient to create pumpkin pudding. Um, and it's essentially the same thing as a pumpkin pie. Um, we do know that George Washington himself grew pumpkins. Uh, we don't know if, if Amelia Simmons pumpkin pudding would have been served here at Mount Vernon. Um, Washington was having pumpkins grown not only for consumption by people on the estate, but also as a fodder for livestock. Um, he was often a little bit disappointed in uh, the, the fact that they didn't preserve as well as he wanted them to. Um, he experimented with having them dried. Uh, they still didn't keep as fresh as long as he wanted, um, but we do know that they were something that, that were being grown here on the estate. Um, so hopefully you guys have gotten uh, quite uh, an introduction to some of, some of the most um, iconic foods of Thanksgiving um, and, and kind of their 18th century origins. Um, we also talked a little bit today about, uh, you know, the different types of foods that would have been available in the 18th century uh, at this time of year. Um, about the enslaved community, uh, the importance of foraging and gleaning this time of year, the importance of uh, sweet potatoes, um, drying as a preservation technique. Um, and thank you for joining me for this seasonal e eating series. I hope you've enjoyed it.